Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, you're here at the Galita and San Ines Valley presentation of Dr. Russell Zendo. Dr. Russell Endo, he'll speak about um, Santa Barbara County residents and the Japanese internment during World War II. Um, this is part of the Book to Action program at the libraries uh, for the month uh, this spring, April through July. Uh, we, um, the, we are reading as a community George Dockey's They Called Us Enemy, a memoir of his experience uh, during the war in the internment camps. Uh, at this point, I will introduce Dr. Endo. Uh, Dr. Russell Endo is a retired professor of sociology and Asian American studies. He has taught and done research in Asian American studies since 1970 at the Boulder and Denver campuses of the University of Colorado and at the University of Washington. Russ is also the primary researcher for the Tuna Canyon Detention Station Coalition. His work deals with the World War II arrest and detention of Japanese, German, and Italian immigrant leaders in Southern California. He's especially interested in the plans and decisions by government officials and the reasons for these. So Russ spends a lot of time looking at documents, especially at the National Archives. He augments his disinformation with oral history and written accounts by detainees. Today, he will be sharing some of his research. It's my, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce Dr. Russell Endo. Okay, thank you very much, Brent, for that kind introduction. And uh, I do want to thank the Golito Valley and Santa Ynez Valley Libraries for having me as part of your Book to, Honor, book to Action program. It's an honor to be a participant. Uh, I actually grew up in the Los Angeles area. And when I was a child, my family made a lot of sightseeing visits to Santa Barbara County. So I'm actually pretty familiar with the geography of the area. Uh, also, my father liked to surf fish and he brought me on a number of trips to fish uh, at Carpinteria, uh, Golita Beach, and also uh, off the sand dunes west of Guadalupe. Uh, so I've had a lot of uh, early experience in Santa Barbara County. Uh, as an adult, also, I've been to the county a number of times, usually to the university, to UCSB. So I am very pleased to be back again, uh, although only in a virtual manner. Uh, let me just say a, a few seconds worth of stuff about my presentation. Uh, I try to cover a part of World War II history that hasn't received much attention. But I think it is important for a complete understanding of the injustices of this war. And I think we need to know what took place, but also how this process unfolded. Uh, it's only with this knowledge that we can begin to ensure that such injustices never occur again. So in my presentation, I try to cover the main points in sort of a start to finish manner. But I will be available afterward for questions. And I hope the viewers find the presentation to be informative. Welcome to this presentation. I am a retired professor of sociology and Asian American studies at the University of Colorado. I am also on the board of the Tuna Canyon Detention Station Coalition. Many people know about the World War II mass incarceration of Japanese Americans, but fewer people know what happened beforehand, the incarceration of thousands of Japanese, German, and Italian immigrant leaders. To better illustrate this important subject, I'm going to focus on what happened to the Japanese in one region, Santa Barbara County in California. But such events occurred in hundreds of places throughout the United States and affected Germans and Italians as well as Japanese. Before talking about World War II, I want to briefly discuss pre-war Japanese in Santa Barbara County. Japanese settlement in Santa Barbara County occurred in and around four towns, Guadalupe, Santa Maria, and Lompoc at the left side of this map, and in the city of Santa Barbara on the right side. Significant Japanese migration began in the early 1900s. Many Japanese in the northern part of the county were involved in farming, first as laborers and then as farmers. 
Japanese immigrants were forbidden by law from owning land, so they leased farmland from white property owners. The Japanese in Guadalupe, Santa Maria, and Lompoc were pioneers in the fresh vegetable industry. Japanese farmers grew crops such as celery, tomatoes, peas, carrots, spinach, cabbage, broccoli, lettuce, and cauliflower. This picture was taken by noted photographer Dorothea Lang. Agricultural products were shipped to Southern California and elsewhere in the US. Four Japanese grower shippers dominated this industry. Japanese in the northern part of Santa Barbara County generally experienced less animosity from whites than occurred in other parts of California. Whites benefited from leasing land to the Japanese and selling them farm and other products. By 1940, a majority of the Japanese population were American-born children of the Japanese immigrants. These children attended public schools and were more Americanized than their immigrant parents. Santa Maria and Lompoc were more settled communities of families than Guadalupe, and they had higher proportions of Japanese employed in non-farm occupations. Japanese settlement in the southern part of Santa Barbara County occurred in and around the city of Santa Barbara. Some Japanese worked as small farmers growing produce. Others were employed in the small Japan town. Many worked for wealthy white residents as gardeners, cooks, and domestics. Many Santa Barbara Japanese lived on the estates of their employers in Montecito and Mission Canyon. They developed close personal relationships with their employers. Because of these social ties and the non-threatening nature of the small Japanese population, pre-war relationships between whites and Japanese in the city of Santa Barbara were generally friendly. Let's take a closer look at the pre-war Japantown sections of Guadalupe, Santa Maria, Lompoc, and Santa Barbara. In and around each of these towns, the Japanese population was large enough to support a range of businesses and institutions. Examples of these were Buddhist and Christian churches. There were groceries, hotels, and restaurants. And there were automobile garages, also boarding houses, doctors and dentists offices, tailors, florists, drugstores, laundries, pool halls, fish markets, barber shops, and Japanese organizations and language schools. The next two slides contain maps of the Japan towns of Guadalupe and Santa Barbara produced by the Japan Town Atlas Project. In 1940, the Japanese population of Guadalupe was 933, while that of Santa Barbara was 375. According to the California Japan Towns Project, before World War II, there were about 50 Japanese businesses and institutions in Guadalupe, 40 in Santa Maria, 20 in Lompoc, and 40 in the city of Santa Barbara. In the 1940 census, the Japanese population of Santa Barbara County was 2,187. I want to talk now about U.S. government plans before World War II. 
During the 1930s, U.S. officials were concerned about the growing strength and aggressiveness of Japan, Germany, and Italy. Plans were developed to safeguard the internal security of the United States. One plan was to create lists of individuals in the U.S. who would be arrested in the event of a war. The best known was the Custodial Detention Index, created by FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover. Lists were also compiled by the Office of Naval Intelligence and the Army's Military Intelligence Division. The Special Defense Unit was in charge of evaluating individuals. It used three main categories, A, B, and C, with A being the most dangerous. Suspicious Japanese, German, and Italian organizations in America were put into these three categories. Organization officials and members were then given individual A, B, or C classifications. For Japanese, such persons included religious, business, and other community leaders, and members of organizations with ties to Japan. However, the FBI continued to evaluate individuals on its own. FBI arrest lists also included Japanese in occupations seen as dangerous, such as fishermen and Japanese language school teachers. In 1940, the government required all adult non-citizens to register and be fingerprinted. Just after the start of the war, in 1942, all non-citizens from enemy nations had to register. Let's turn now to World War II. When the war began, President Franklin Roosevelt issued Presidential Proclamations 2525, 2526, and 2527. This allowed the government to incarcerate non-citizens or enemy aliens from Japan, Germany, and Italy. It also authorized curfews, travel restrictions, and the exclusion of enemy aliens from designated areas, for example, around ports, airports, rail yards, power plants, and military facilities. Possession of items such as firearms, cameras, and shortwave radios was forbidden. For Japanese in Santa Barbara County, the start of the war created uncertainty and fear. Many proclaimed their loyalty to America. The white population had mixed reactions about Japanese residents. But to their credit, some influential figures, such as Santa Barbara newspaper editor Thomas Stork, expressed their support of the Japanese. On December 7, 1941, the FBI began arresting Japanese, Germans, and Italians throughout the United States. After 11 days, over 1,400 Japanese, 1,200 Germans, and 200 Italians had been arrested. FBI action in Santa Barbara County was also swift. On December 7th and 8th, 1941, 14 Japanese immigrant leaders were arrested by the FBI in Guadalupe, Santa Maria, and Lompoc. Within two weeks, two more Japanese and one German were also arrested. Because of limited space at Department of Justice detention facilities, these 17 men were held in the Santa Barbara County Jail. This slide and the next one contain very important documents. This slide shows a contract invitation to the Santa Barbara County Sheriff for the detention of enemy aliens in the Santa Barbara County Jail. This slide shows the award of this contract. From December 9th to December 20th, 1941, the Santa Barbara County Jail was, by this contract, a World War II Department of Justice incarceration facility. And the city of Santa Barbara was one of the many places in the United States 
where Japanese and Germans were officially confined during the war. The 16 Japanese in the Santa Barbara County Jail were sent to the San Pedro Detention Station. Some were later transferred to the Tuna Canyon Detention Station. I will talk more about Tuna Canyon later. All Japanese arrested in Southern California were to have hearings in Los Angeles. But General John D. Witt of the Western Defense Command wanted enemy aliens, especially Japanese, moved away from the West Coast. So the 16 Japanese, along with others, were sent to the Fort Missoula, Montana detention camp on December 16th and 25th. This was the first of many removals of Japanese from Southern California. Other actions were taken against Japanese immigrants in Santa Barbara County. The California Highway Patrol set up roadblocks and searched cars occupied by Japanese. 14 more Japanese immigrants were arrested in January and February 1942. All were sent to Tuna Canyon. These early arrests sent shockwaves throughout Santa Barbara County Japanese communities. People felt threatened and that they were under constant government surveillance. This had a chilling effect on community activities. In early 1942, the distinguished African-American attorney, Hugh Macbeth, went to Guadalupe and the city of Santa Barbara to investigate the arrests of Japanese. He discovered no evidence of disloyalty. Macbeth instead found that these arrests had been promoted by white agricultural interests who wanted to take over Japanese farmland. Santa Barbara County District Attorney Percy Heckendorf also stirred up anti-Japanese sentiment. He argued that Japanese posed a security threat. To bolster his case, Heckendorf used maps showing the proximity of Japanese farmland in Santa Barbara County to oil fields, an army base, and critical infrastructure. What he neglected to say was that the Japanese were working in this area long before these things were built. In February 1942, the FBI began mass arrests of Japanese immigrants in parts of Southern California. Santa Barbara County's turn came in mid-February. This document shows that FBI targets included leaders of local Japanese associations. But these organizations were not a threat to the internal security of the United States. So the FBI was arresting innocent people. This document shows that FBI targets included members of two so-called Japanese patriotic societies. However, these organizations were not engaged in any subversive activity. So again, the FBI was arresting innocent people. FBI targets in Santa Barbara County also included leaders of religious and farm organizations. On February 18th, 142 men were arrested, primarily in Guadalupe and the Santa Maria Valley. On February 19th, 112 men were arrested in the same areas, as well as in Lompoc and the city of Santa Barbara. 11 more men were arrested the next day. The total number of arrests was 265. This was the second largest FBI raid conducted on the Pacific coast. About 50 men were not immediately arrested for various reasons. Some, for example, were away from home on business or other work, and there were errors on FBI arrest lists. About 50 FBI agents, county sheriffs, local police, and California Highway Patrol officers made these arrests. Arrested men were taken by the Army and military trucks to the Santa Barbara County Jail. These arrests were covered by local and Los Angeles newspapers. From government documents, I have discovered that the information newspapers reported was not always accurate.
Of the 265 arrested men, 217 were transferred to Tunic Canyon. The rest were sent to the San Pedro Detention Station. And the FBI was not finished with Santa Barbara County. On March 13th, the FBI conducted a mass arrest of over 250 Japanese language school teachers in Southern California. In Santa Barbara County, 12 people were arrested. Among these were a husband and wife and two Buddhist priests. All of the men were transferred to Tuna Canyon. FBI arrests in Santa Barbara County finally ended with the apprehension of four men in early April. In Lompoc, Daishotana was a new Buddhist priest. He and his wife taught in the church's language school. Daishotana was arrested on March 13th. He kept a detailed diary of his wartime experiences. Here is how Daishotana described his arrest. The person who will be reading this in other parts of Tana's diary is Nancy Oda, the president of the Tuna Canyon Detention Station Coalition. These arrests happened because of the Dyes Committee's report that accused the language schools of being anti-American organizations. Thus, we see the arrests as well as the confiscation of the school's textbooks. Of course, these organizations taught second generation students not only the language, but also Japanese values. But somehow, the Americans do not accept the fact that these schools also teach students to be sincere and faithful to the U.S. During this war between the U.S. and Japan, there is not a single language school administrator who ran their school to somehow benefit Japan. They simply taught that being an American of Japanese ancestry should not mean that they are inferior to white Americans. This should be something Americans find agreeable. In total, 310 Japanese immigrant men and one woman were arrested. Most of the Japanese immigrant men in Santa Barbara County were arrested. They left behind wives and children who suddenly had to fend for themselves. These arrests removed nearly all the senior leaders of Japanese communities. Japanese families and communities in Santa Barbara County were vulnerable to the rising tide of anti-Japanese racism. As we have seen, the first prison camp for most Santa Barbara County detainees was the Tuna Canyon Detention Station. Tuna Canyon was located in the town of Tahunga, about 14 miles northwest of the Los Angeles City Hall. Before the war, plans were made to incarcerate enemy aliens from Southern California in San Pedro. A search was conducted for an additional site. Among the places considered were two in Ventura County. Just before the war, an unused Civilian Conservation Corps camp in Tahunga was selected. Hours after the Pearl Harbor attack, this camp was turned over to the Department of Justice. On December 16, 1941, Tuna Canyon received its first prisoners. This is how Daisho Tana described his arrival at Tuna Canyon. The camp was surrounded by barbed wire fences 10 feet high. We went through luggage inspection and I was assigned to Barrack F. Dinner tonight was a Japanese meal and included hot miso soup. I felt so relieved while eating it. There was an inspection count of the Japanese at 8.30 p.m. and lights were off at 10 p.m. I recited Buddhist texts quietly on my bed in the dark. It was too cold to fall asleep, but I slept well after wrapping my body in a blanket. I woke up in the CCC temporary internment camp in Tahunga. Rain last night turned to snow on the mountains. Woke up at 6 a.m. 
at 645 guard inspection, 7 a.m. breakfast and room cleaning, 1045 guard inspection, at noon lunch, 415 guard inspection, 5 p.m. dinner, 830 guard inspection, 10 p.m. lights out. Living in this collective an ordered environment made me think of regimented military life. We had to stay 10 feet away from the barbed wire fence. Being cut off from the outside is the most painful thing about being in camp. Tuna Canyon had six barracks, which could house up to 300 prisoners. Tuna Canyon had an office building, an infirmary, and a recreation building. The recreation building had a library, and it was used for Buddhist and Christian religious services and to show movies. This is the Tuna Canyon mess hall. Detainee cooks were allowed to prepare meals. Tuna Canyon prisoners were guarded by Border Patrol officers. This guard station had a view of the vehicle entrance. Merrill Scott was in charge of running Tuna Canyon. Here he is seen with Willard Kelly. Kelly was in charge of the Department of Justice detention and internment. Family members were allowed to visit detainees at certain times. Here is one of Daisho Tana's descriptions of visitors. Visitors came at 1 p.m. Visitors are permitted on Sundays and Wednesdays. After the brief 30-minute visit, detainees near the fence and their families in a bicycle parking lot waved to each other, all in tears. How could one communicate through a great during the 30 minute visit. A fellow internee who could speak English was required to be present to translate if one could only speak Japanese. Prisoners and families could only touch their fingers through the grate. I can only imagine how the families felt seeing their husbands or fathers in prison. Many detainees did not sleep that night after lights out. Letting them see their families in this unsatisfactory way is not necessarily kindness. Detainees maintained vegetable gardens. At one time they had a cornfield. There was a wood shop where small items could be made. One detainee made ink stands, which he sent to family members. Activities for detainees included playing horseshoes and baseball. In this photograph, notice the guard tower near the fence and the watchtower on the hill. Even with such activities, thoughts of family were always present, as Daisho Tana points out. The spring sun is shining like it might in a southern region, and those confined here are playing baseball. It is good for us to engage in activities like this and forget ourselves and our time as detainees. There must be some here who have concerns, such as the state of their family business, which they cannot discuss with others. While there is no doubt that we all have love for our families that we had to leave behind during those twice a week meetings with them through the barbed wire fence, there must be many detainees who cannot but stifle their true feelings. The detainees release stress by playing baseball, but they are simultaneously tired from preparing for the next transfer and feel sad to only be able to encounter their wives who bring them delicious food by entwining their fingers for three minutes through the barbed wire while guards look over them.
During the war, over 2,000 people were detained at Tuna Canyon. These included Japanese, Germans, and Italians from the United States, and 200 brought to this country from Latin America. Tuna Canyon closed at the end of October 1943. After Tuna Canyon, most Santa Barbara County Japanese were sent to detention camps in Montana, North Dakota, or New Mexico. Daisho Otana was transferred from Tuna Canyon to Santa Fe, New Mexico in March 1942. At these new detention camps, Japanese were given a hearing to determine their fate. However, hearings were not trials. There was no due process. There were no judges, only a board of two or three civilians. Detainees were not allowed to have lawyers. They did not know in advance what accusations or evidence would be presented. They were not allowed to do any cross-examination. I have examined the records for several hundred hearings. Some hearings were short, others lasted hours. Some hearing boards tried to make objective decisions, but many hearing boards uncritically accepted government allegations of detainee disloyalty, and detainees were presumed to be guilty unless they could prove their innocence. At Daisho Tana's hearing, the hearing board recommended his permanent internment. Tana was sent to the Army internment camp at Lordsburg, New Mexico. In June 1943, he was transferred back to Santa Fe. During Daisho Tana's incarceration, all of the remaining Japanese residents of Santa Barbara County, including Tana's wife and children, were removed from their homes at the end of April 1942. They were first sent to the Tulare Detention Facility. In August, most were transferred to the Gila River, Arizona War Relocation Authority Camp. This was part of the mass incarceration of West Coast Japanese that included immigrants and their American-born children. Daisho Tana was not released to rejoin his family until after the end of World War II. Family separation was one of the most devastating consequences of the incarceration of Japanese immigrants. Emotional responses to separation were conveyed in many ways. Here is a poem written by Daisho Tana's wife, which was sent to him while he was at Tuna Canyon. This poem and material on the next slide will be read by Nancy Hayata, a board member of the Tuna Canyon Detention Station Coalition. If I open my eyes, I can see my husband. Even if I close them, my husband appears as mine. Shackled, give me wings so that I can go to where my husband sleeps. I try to be strong, but a wife's attachments never end day and night. Waking up in the middle of the night, thinking I caught a glimpse of him. It was just the shadow of a pillow. Detainee family members pleaded with high government officials. The most poignant letters were written by young children. Here are excerpts from two letters on behalf of detainees who are not from Santa Barbara County. Last week, a letter came from my father saying that he would not be able to come home to us anymore. My mother is about to have a baby. I am eight years old. During that time, I will have to take care of the other children, and it would be very hard for me. So we would like our father to come back, please. My father hasn't done anything bad. We know that, so we wonder why he doesn't come home. Since my father has been gone, we have been very sad. For our sake, will you please let our father come home right away? When is my father going to be released? Many people who have gone into camp the same time as him have come back, but why hasn't he? 
My mother worries so much about my father, so she can't sleep. She might get sick, so please try to release him. I am only 12. Will you please answer this letter, for I will be waiting. I want to conclude by pointing out that the arrest and incarceration of Japanese, German, and Italian non-citizens at the beginning of World War II was legal, although this power was greatly abused by the government. The legal basis was the Alien Enemies Act of 1798, which was recodified in 1918. This slide shows part of this law. This law is triggered by a presidential proclamation following a declaration of war or an actual attempted or threatened predatory incursion by a hostile nation or government. Note that an actual attack on the United States is not necessary. All that is required is what a president decides is an external threat. This gives presidents immense power, which can be used in the future against any non-citizen groups in the US they see as threats to national security. Before I end, I want to reiterate that I have focused on Japanese in one region, Santa Barbara County. But such events during World War II occurred in hundreds of places throughout the United States and to Germans and Italians as well as Japanese. Thank you for listening to this presentation. Please feel free to contact me at any time with questions or comments. American internment in Santa Barbara County. Um, I wonder, do you have anything you'd like to add to the presentation? Any other points that you think important that should be mentioned? Yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, add three things. Uh, I didn't put these in the presentation because they'd be a bit of a digression, but I think they are worth mentioning. Uh, first of all, when uh, men from Santa Barbara County were transferred to Tuna Canyon, it turned out that Tuna Canyon actually couldn't accommodate everybody. It was almost a capacity. So the Department of Justice made arrangements to send some of the men to an army internment camp at Griffith Park in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. So Griffith Park became a temporary Tuna Canyon substation for a very short period of time. And those of the viewers who are familiar with Griffith Park, uh, the camp was located in the northwest corner of the park where the travel town uh, attraction uh, now sits. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing I want to mention is that before the war, FBI arrest lists included American citizens as well as non-citizens because there were some American citizens that they felt were uh, uh, engaged in possibly su suspicious activity. Mm -hmm. After w Pearl Harbor, some of the citizens on the U.S. mainland were arrested by the U.S. government, even though the government didn't have the authority to do this. Uh, most of them were immediately released, uh, but the government managed to interrogate a lot of people before they let them go. And in Santa Barbara County, one American born Japanese from Guadalupe was arrested on December 7th and fortunately was released the next day. And the third thing I want to mention is that last year, legislation was introduced into Congress to repeal the Alien Enemies Act. Uh, this Legisl proposed legislation was never voted on, but it actually was reintroduced into Congress a few weeks ago on June 1st. Hmm. This legislation is called the Neighbors Not Enemies Act. And the author of the bill is Representative Ilhan Omar of Minnesota. And there are currently 40 co-sponsors to this piece of legislation. So if any of your viewers are interested in this, uh, you can do a search on Neighbors not Enemies Act, and type in 2021. Uh, that'll get you to the most current information. Thank you very much for that follow-up on, on the presentation and those three points. Um, right now, um, we're open for comments or questions. If anyone has any, please type them into the comments section. Um, in the meantime, um, 
if we could chat, Dr. Andrew and I, about the, about the presentation. Um, one of the things I noticed um, was the sheer injustice of it all, right? I mean, these were people who were interned on the basis of uh, just a suspicion that they might be, right, um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, a threat to the country, right, without any kind of judicial procedure, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and uh, it's outrageous, right? Uh, of yes. course, yeah. And um, is there anything you'd like to say about that? Um, I noticed that your, your family, your grandfather, had to register in 1942 uh, under the Alien Registration Act. Um, mm -hmm. Do you care to speak about your family's experience? Um, yes, uh, thank you. Let me, let me take uh, just mm -hmm. a few moments to talk a little bit about my family's experience. Yes. Uh, and I'm gonna focus on my uh, paternal grandfather because he was the one who was arrested from the FBI. So a little bit of background, my, my grandfather was from Shimizu, which is a town on the Japanese coast about 100 miles southwest of Tokyo. And uh, he came to the United States in 1900 at age 15 to seek his fortune. Uh, he initially worked uh, as a laborer. Uh, he, his first job actually was at the Union Pacific Railroad in Wyoming and Utah. And then he moved to the San Francisco Bay Area and he worked as a farm laborer and as a houseboy and as a clerk. And after 15 years, he got married. So uh, about a year after his marriage, he moved to Southern California to Terminal Island. Uh, Terminal Island was the site of a very well-known Japanese fishing community. And my grandfather started off working on sardine boats. And then he got himself a tuna boat and started fishing for tuna off the California coast and off the Mexican coast too. He used to travel down Baja California and down the Mexican coast. He later opened up a sword fishing business in San Pedro. And he was a member of a number of organizations, uh, the most notable, notable of which was the Compton uh, Japanese Language School. Mm. So at the end of March, 1942, my family, his family received a notice that they were gonna be removed from their homes in a week. And this was part of the mass incarceration of West Coast Japanese. But a day later, an FBI agent showed up at my grandfather's door and he was arrested because of his uh, involvement with the Japanese language school. So without him, my family had less than a week to sell or store everything that they owned uh, and also the uh, uh, property uh, that was connected to my grandfather's business. And because of this, they suffered huge financial loss. Uh, to give you an example, uh, the main part of my grandfather's business was a fishing boat and a fishing barge. And my family was only able to sell that, or his family was only able to sell that for what they estimate was 8% of its actual worth. So they took a huge loss. Uh, they had a pier at the site of his fishing business and also a warehouse that they used to store things. And when they returned after the war, the, both the pier and the warehouse were gone. So my grandfather was arrested uh, without a warrant and uh, the FBI managed to issue a warrant uh, eight days later. Uh, this apparently was standard operating procedure for the FBI. They, I, don't, I don't know why this happened, but a lot of people were arrested uh, without the requisite warrant. Uh, his home was searched during his arrest, which is also what happened to other people who were arrested by the FBI. And in the case of my father, a grandfather's search, uh, this was also done without a warrant. And then he was taken to the Los Angeles County Jail and then to Tuna Canyon Detention Station. So my father had a hearing in Los Angeles and he was accused at the hearing of spreading Japanese propaganda through the language school, which was of course complete nonsense. And he was asked some questions also about his fishing business. Uh, at one point he was asked whether he ever uh, communicated with uh, Imperial Japanese submarines while he was out in his fishing boat. And my grandfather considered that to be a ridiculous question. And, and of course he didn't do that. Uh, my grandfather was also asked whether he monitored shipping traffic in and out of Los Angeles Harbor and whether he was sending reports to the Japanese government. And my grandfather considered that to be a pretty stupid question too. And of course he wasn't doing that. Uh, the hearing board at one point uh, became suspicious because my grandfather had made a visit to Japan in the 1930s. 
And it turned out that uh, he went back to Japan because his mother was dying and he wanted to see her one last time before she passed away. So these questions went on and on and on. And I know a lot about this because my father was actually at the hearing and uh, he told me in detail what happened. At the end of the hearing, an FBI agent came forward and accused my grandfather of having contraband at his house, which was seized during his arrest. Uh, he was alleged to have had a camera, a binocular, and some hunting guns. And these were things actually that were turned into the police several months earlier. And my grandfather had gotten a receipt for these things. And as it turned out, my father, who was at the hearing, came to the hearing with a lot of my grandfather's records, including these receipts. So my so my father raises his hand and says, well, wait a minute. And so the FBI has essentially caught him a lie, a blatant lie. And I think partly because of this, my grandfather was paroled to rejoin his family, which was now at the Santa Anita detention facility. So my family spends the war uh, at Jerome and at Rower and uh, later resettles in Chicago uh, for several years. And then they move back to California in the 1950s. And uh, let me just end this story, I guess, by saying one thing about my parents. Uh, my parents met and got married in Jerome. And they were able to uh, leave Jerome in 1943 to resettle in Chicago because they were considered to be loyal American citizens. And, and, and also because uh, my father found a job in Chicago. Uh, in the early 50s, my family moved back to Southern California and they settled in Tahunga. So I actually grew up in a home probably less than five miles from the site of the Tuna Canyon detention station where my grandfather was held during the war. Well, thank you so much for sharing that story of your family's experience during the war. I think one good thing came out of it was your parents meeting in Jerome. Yeah, that's what my mother said, that the only good thing that came out of the war was that I met your father. Oh. <laughs> well, that is great. Um, uh, speaking of um, getting back to the, the presentation that you, 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 I noticed you used a lot of the memoirs of, or the diary and of Daisho Tana, the reverend, the, the priest, the Buddhist priest. Um, could you tell us about, about how you got access to the, the diaries? Are there any, um, and uh, what happened to him after the war? Uh, I noticed you said he was in turn for the duration of the war and was released mm -hmm. in 1945, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah, we were able that... to get, I'm sorry. Yes, no, so, sorry. Yeah. We, were, we were able to get the diary uh, mm -hmm. from Professor Duncan Williams, who's uh, mm -hmm. at the University of Southern California. Yeah. And uh, Duncan has done a lot of work with this diary, as well as with a lot of other material mm -hmm. uh, related to Japanese religious figures. And mm -hmm. he translated a portion of the diary for us. I and uh, we have this on our Tuna Canyon Detention Station Coalition website. And uh, it happened to fit in with the presentation, so I used this. Uh, yes. Yes. I don't know a lot about uh, Reverend Tana's career after mm -hmm. the war. But he was a Buddhist priest for a number of years in Palo Alto, the Palo Alto Buddhist Church. Ah. Uh, eventually managed to uh, uh, get his life back in order. Uh, and uh, Wonderful. He, uh, at least he survived the war and he did. Uh, hopefully yes. he thrived after it as well. Um, I was really struck too by the, um, the poignancy of those, uh, the, the letters mm -hmm. that those children wrote, you know, um, that really, um, tugged on my heart springs, so to speak, right? And of course, the, the, the poem of mm -hmm. the Reverend Tana's wife, right? It was quite moving, the reference yeah. to the pillow and the um, mistaking that for her husband mm -hmm. in the middle of the night. Yeah, um, the... And what brings up the separation of families mm -hmm. was devastating. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, they took, uh, you said in Santa Barbara County, 265 men, right? Um, uh, incarcerated them. Right of a of a grand population of about two thousand Japanese in Santa Barbara County. That's ten percent, mm -hmm. more than ten percent, mm -hmm. right, of that population incarcerated. Yeah, families, right, devastated, mm -hmm. right, left without a way to survive. Mm -hmm. um, the emotional, the trauma of that alone, right, is just uh, hard to understand. 
Yeah, you see this, I think, in uh, mm -hmm. letters that are written both by wives, usually wives who are separated mm -hmm. from their husbands, mm -hmm. and also children. And what's remarkable about, about the children's letters, and these are not the only ones. I mean, mm -hmm. if you look through the Department of Justice files, a lot of files have letters by, by children who are in uh, grammar school or junior high school or high school. And these are being written to high government officials. Uh, some of these letters are being sent to the Attorney General of the United States mm -hmm. or the head of the FBI. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I get the children are smart. They're going right to the main source of the problem <laughs> and sending the, these letters. Go to the top. Uh, I, I mentioned a little bit about my grandfather's financial losses because I think this mm -hmm. probably happened to families in Santa Barbara County. Mm -hmm. Although I, I don't know this for sure because I have not seen uh, oral history or diary accounts. But I think it's probably the case that uh, when the man, who was usually the head of the family, mm -hmm. uh, was in prison, and then, you know, a month later, a couple of months later, the whole family is removed. Uh, the family really doesn't have a lot of time to get all their affairs in order. You know, if they, if they uh, uh, have investments in farmland or they own a house or even just your everyday, uh, 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 the stuff you have in your house. I mean, if you can imagine somebody telling you you had to leave home in a week, I mean, just dealing with all the furniture and your clothes and everything is a, it's a, it's a lot of work. Yes, I can imagine. Um, which reminds me, uh, in your in the presentation, you mentioned in Santa Barbara County, right, um, the African American lawyer um, Hugh Macbeth, mm -hmm. when he um, went to Santa Maria and uh, checked in to see, he he said he, his his report was that there was no um, no no disloyalty at all by yeah. African Americans. You also referenced the Attorney General. Uh, talking about um i think his name was heckendorf yeah right? the, the, yeah yeah the attorney i'm sorry the attorney yeah the uh, county uh, county uh, the county county That's attorney right. yeah yeah and um and the maps that he used to prove that you know the japanese american were a threat right and mm -hmm. it was completely bogus of course mm -hmm. but it, it made me think that um there was a certain amount of opportunism here uh, on mm -hmm. the white community mm -hmm. in terms of, uh, of of landowners to to seize japanese property right yes um, yes. which, which, you know, I wondered if you could speak to that. I mean, is that something that was uh, true throughout Southern California? I know that was the area of your uh, research. Yeah, they, you see this a lot in Southern California and actually also mm -hmm. in other parts of uh, mm -hmm. uh, California and Washington and Oregon. And the interest that represented farmers, farm organizations and growership mm -hmm. associations and stuff mm -hmm. uh, were very strong in their uh, uh, advocacy of removing Japanese from the West Coast because they knew that their members, their constituents would profit from this. And they did. I mean, people had to abandon their land and it was taken over by others. So there's a certain so, political opportunism there mm -hmm. on their behalf. Yes. I want to bring us back to the, the, um, the, the issue of loyalty, right? And mm -hmm. um, uh, among the Japanese American community, right? I mean, these were Japanese Americans who weren't allowed to become citizens, people who had settled mm -hmm. here, uh, who were excluded from that, but had children who were Americans mm -hmm. right, and were established in the community. Mm -hmm. um, could you speak to that, the issue of loyalty among, uh, as, a, as a general issue? Okay. This is actually uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, a very complex, complex issue. And I, sure. loyalty is actually a very difficult concept because, uh, I mean, how do you measure loyalty? Uh, how do how do people know, for example, that I'm in, I'm a loyal American or that you're a loyal American? Uh, we don't take a test or we don't wear a little badge that says, "Well, we're loyal citizens." Uh, I think what happens is that we assume that people are loyal unless they manifest some act of disloyalty, and then we begin to investigate this. And in the case of the Japanese, no Japanese were ever arrested and convicted of acts of espionage or sabotage. Mm -hmm. And the sad part of the story is that the government knew ahead of time that the Japanese in the United States were not going to be a security threat. Mm -hmm. uh, to give you one example, they had broken into the uh, Japanese consulate in Los Angeles mm -hmm. some months before the war, and they had uh, made copies of a lot of the correspondence by Japanese diplomats. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that these Japanese, imperial Japanese diplomats were writing about how untrustworthy 
the Japanese were in in, the, in America were, and they they couldn't be counted on to be spies and to help Imperial Japan during the war. So the government actually knew this. Uh, you're correct, though, that uh, the concept comes up again for the immigrants uh, because they're asked about this, notably in their hearings. Yes. Uh, hearing officers are very anxious to establish loyalty. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately for hearing officers, this is a black and white issue. You know, you, you know you're asked a question, are you loyal to Japan or are you loyal to the United States? And they expect you know, a, a, an answer to either one or the other. Right. And the immigrants had a lot of difficulty with this question because they were citizens of Japan. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were not allowed to become American citizens. Mm-hmm. Uh, they grew up in Japanese culture, which were, they were very familiar with. Mm-hmm. And most of them still had family members in Japan. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, many of them had kids who were born in the United States and who had attended American schools. And in some cases, some of these children eventually uh, ended up in the U.S. serving in the U.S. military. Mm. So when these questions get asked of the uh, detainees, they try to explain how difficult it is to answer. You know, they're sort of saying, well, on the one hand, you know, I have attachments to Japan because of this. But on the other hand, I have attachments to America because of this. Mm -hmm. And in a way, they can't give a, a black and white answer. Mm-hmm. Uh, unfortunately, hearing officers think that they're waffling, that they're trying mm-hmm. to hide something, and so they're seen as guilty. Uh, sometimes these answers, uh, these questions, incidentally, are asked in a very crude manner. Uh, there was one hearing where the hearing board asked a detainee to imagine he was on a field. Mm-hmm. And on one side of the field, there were American forces. And on the other side of the field, there were Imperial Japanese forces. And they were shooting at each other. Mm-hmm. And the detainee was asked the question, if we gave you a gun, which side would you join? Mm-hmm. You know, impossible question to answer. Uh, a lot of people tried to get around the question by saying, well, it's unfortunate that these two countries, both of which I love, are fighting mm-hmm. each other. Mm-hmm. And that's the honest truth, I think, for a lot of people. Uh, or they say, well, you know, this is, you know, I. I've never thought about this before. I can't give you an answer. And uh, it was very difficult for people to answer this question. This was a, this was one of the first times during the war that Japanese were asked about their loyalty. Yes. And this comes up later on in the War Relocation Authority camps, as you know from George Takei's book, because yes. of the infamous questions 27 and 28. Yes, the, the famous loyalty questions, yes, in which um, his father, George Takei's father, was identi- uh, went with the no and no, and so was identified as a no no. Mm-hmm. And um, that question of loyalty, though, it's and that choosing what side, right, to to, to be on. I mean, uh, it's 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 a question that's also ignorant of history, though, because um, the the not just the Japanese Americans, but all Asian Americans were excluded from American citizenship, and mm-hmm. there were uh, there were there were laws against them. You know, mm-hmm. even participating in any kind of way mm-hmm. in, 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 in many communities, mm-hmm. right? So, I mean, but at the same time, they settled here and had families, right? Mm-hmm. So how could you ask? I mean, it's, it's just an, uh, such an unfair question mm-hmm. to ask, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and put in such a black and white way as well, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But as I say, it's a complex issue. And mm-hmm. uh, I mean, and, and there, there are similar questions that arise today about mm-hmm. this. Yeah. Um, and, and the problem, again, at hearings was that uh, the allegations against the uh, the, the uh, Japanese who were at hearings mm-hmm. uh, were that they were there because they were disloyal, that there was right. some suspicion about them. So yeah. in general, you had to prove that you were not disloyal. Yeah. So that's it. And that's actually even more difficult than proving you are loyal. I mean, how would, negative. You, yeah, yes. how would you prove that you are not a disloyal American? Right. Yes. Yeah. No, no. It's an impossible situation to be in. Right. Uh, 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 well, uh, we've actually, I just noticed that we are fully an hour into this program and I wanted to check and see whether we had any comments or questions uh, from our audience. Um, I don't believe we have. Um, so I would like to say 
we do have one comment here from someone on YouTube. Uh, thanking you, Russ, for such oh, okay. a detailed, <laughs> wide-ranging, moving and thought-provoking mm -hmm. presentation. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, let, let me just comment on one thing that uh, uh, Carrie had asked me earlier, and yeah. this had to do with the amount of preparation that the government made ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And I think when you look at what happened during World War II, it seemed like there was a very clear plan, and the government was a well-oiled machine. You know, they had gotten the names ahead of time. And then when the Pearl Harbor attack occurred, they rushed in and arrested everybody and they processed everybody and so forth. Mm -hmm. And when you look at government documents, you realize that although the government was prepared in some sense, a lot of meetings have been held between various agencies, uh, especially in 1941, uh, the government actually wasn't ready mm. for the beginning of the war. Uh, they didn't have, for example, enough facilities in Southern California, which is why some people were held in the Santa Barbara County Jail for a couple uh, of yes. weeks rather than being put somewhere else. And this happens throughout Southern California. You know, way more people got arrested than had been expected. Mm -hmm. And there was a fair amount of confusion at the beginning. Uh, the FBI did manage to arrest some people uh, mm -hmm. who they weren't supposed to, mistake, mm -hmm. a case of mistaken identity. Mm -hmm. uh, the FBI also uh, did not arrest everybody that they were supposed to, and I'm not quite sure why. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, there was some degree of uh, disorganization, I think, especially in Southern California at the beginning of the war. This gets straightened out later on. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, I think all of this indicates to me that the government, especially the FBI and the rest of the Department of Justice, was not quite ready for the Pearl Harbor attack when it occurred. Mm -hmm. The um, I did remember I did note in the presentation you mentioned the FBI compiling compiling that custodian um, mm -hmm. uh, index the custodial detention, detention index, index I think yes. it was yeah mm -hmm. so I mean the FBI seemed to be you know prepared in their own way for mm -hmm. who they thought but again no proof just suspicions right mm -hmm. based on on based on 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 uh, roles that mm -hmm. people had Japanese Americans had. In their, in their communities, mm -hmm. right? If they had a leadership role, you automatically under suspicion, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so uh, in that way, the, the FBI, yeah, of course, they're looking for a criminal under every stone, I guess. Um, would, is there anything else you'd like to add? Uh, otherwise, I could bring this to a conclusion. Um, well, I'd like to, again, express my appreciation to yeah. the uh, Book to Action program uh, for your libraries. Uh -huh. And uh, I do want to mention that this is actually, uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm actually the third person from the Tuna Candy Detention Station Coalition who has mm -hmm. made a presentation for you. Uh, oh, yes. And, and you have mm -hmm. two excellent uh, presentations by uh, mm -hmm. two of my colleagues who are, uh, w mm -hmm. which are on your website. And uh, next yes. week, you're going to feature uh, another person from the coalition, Conrad Kaspar, who has a very intriguing personal story. Uh, thank it's you. a st story about his family, his father. Yes, yes. Thank you for mentioning that. We do have, um, uh, we have had uh, two, they are up on our website as well as on YouTube and um, Facebook as well, right? And uh, the next week, next Saturday at 2 p.m., we will have Conrad Kaspari speaking about his father's experience at the Tuna Detention Center, Tuna Canyon Detention Center. Um, I'd like to thank um, Dr. Endo for participating, right? A wonderful presentation, and um, I hope that those viewers uh, will recommend it to their friends and pass it along. Um, and uh, I thank you again for participating in, in the program. Um, if any of you would like to look at the, or borrow from us, the the uh, George Takei's memoir, graphic novel memoir, They Called Us Enemy, we do have copies in our shelves, so feel free to contact the library, Solvang, Buelton, or Santa, uh, sorry, or uh, the Galita Valley Library. Again, okay. thank you very much, Dr. Endo. Yeah. Uh, uh, I can't thank you enough. Well, yeah, thank, 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 you very, yes. thank you very much. It's really been my pleasure to be part of this uh, uh, program and to speak today. Thanks again. Uh, to the viewers, thank you for viewing and uh, get in touch with us. Call the library. We're happy to help anything you need help with. Thank you.